Good evening and welcome to the APIS Iron Government program for Thursday, the 24th of June, 2021. Iron Government brings you the latest on government's plans, programs, policies and projects. I am Bavin Olver. Just ahead on this evening's program, Sandals gets ready to launch a chain of resorts here in SVG. We'll learn more about the work being done by scientists to continue monitoring La Soufrere. History comes alive as we learn the importance of the Battle of Carabobo in helping Venezuela achieve independence. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs sat down with the API to discuss the importance of this country's consulates and overseas missions. These stories and more are just ahead, but first, let's join Nelly's Cupid for Newswatch. Good evening. Welcome to this edition of News Watch for Thursday, June 24th, 2021. I'm Nelly Skipid. Thanks for joining us. Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, welcomed the new British High Commissioner to Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, His Excellency Scott Furdenwood, to St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Monday, June 21. His Excellency Furdenwood was on a two-day visit to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and paid courtesy call on Dr. Gonzales to present his letter of introduction. In welcoming the new High Commissioner, Prime Minister Gonzales took the opportunity to thank the Government of the United Kingdom for its direct assistance to the country in the aftermath of the explosive eruption of the La Soufre volcano as well as other areas of support. He highlighted the offer of 55 scholarships offered to Vincentian students by the University of Wales, as well as the assistance provided for the construction of the new port in Kingstown. His Excellency Ferdinand conveyed greetings to Dr. Gonzales on behalf of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, and stated the commitment of the United Kingdom to continue working with St. Vincent and the Grenadines on areas of mutual interest. He indicated that parts of his itinerary include visits to a number of areas in the orange zones impacted by the volcanic eruptions as well as the port project. He pledged to do his best to advance the work of the United Kingdom in the region and to strengthen the relationship between both countries. Vice Chancellor of the University of Wales in the United Kingdom, Professor Medwin Hughes, has written to Prime Minister the Honourable Dr. Ralph Gonzales with the offer of 55 academic scholarships for students of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to undertake study in Wales. The international programme of exchange between the university and this country is valued at £1 million. According to the letter, Professor Hughes says the university is mindful of the key priorities set forth by government in its National Economic and Social Development Plan and has highlighted possible areas of key interest. In order to support the objectives, the University of Wales will offer 40 academic scholarships for full-time study in the University of Wales and an additional 15 will be made available for online delivery. Professor Hughes says the hope is to start the program next academic year and subject to COVID restrictions invite students to join the university from October. The St. Vincent Electricity Services Vinlec is in the process of replacing two engines at the Cane Hall power plant that are over 30 years old. Engineering manager Dr. Vaughan Lewis says the replacement of these two engines ensures that there is enough capacity in place to meet the electricity demands on mainland. And having these two generators in place would return us to a level where we would be more comfortable uh, moving forward. Also, it would help us with our, our maintenance costs because they would be more efficient generators and they would be cheaper to maintain and operate than the previous generators um, that would be replaced. Um, and it would give us the foundation to, to grow into the future um, because the expected lifespan is another 25 to 30 years and set a solid foundation for us to maintain our capacity and grow our capacity in the future. Senior Generation Engineer Augustus Ambrose spoke of the contract and start date and outlined the current state of the project. The project is at the phase where the civil works are being, are being done. There are three different lots of work, if you can call it that. 
One is the engine foundation which is being um, rebuilt because the foundation was changed from the original what we had be before. Secondly, we are also doing what is called work on the auxiliary annex, the floor and the roof. We have decided to um, demolish and recast a new roof. And thirdly, there are some civil works taking place on the outside of the building, specifically in relation to building the foundation for the, the radiators, the pipe supports, and the air filter supports. That's the civil works. The project is estimated to cost approximately 18 million EC dollars. The Roads, Buildings and General Services Authority, Braxa, has commenced construction of a temporary school for over 500 students at the old E.T. Joshua Airport, Tarmac. This as government takes steps to relocate the staff and students of the Thomas Saunders Secondary School in preparation for repairs to be carried out on the existing school structure located in Kingstown. The project will see the construction of eight structures, which will include 19 classrooms, a staff room, washrooms, and a cafeteria. It is being done at an estimated cost of $1.6 million and is expected to be completed by the end of July. The Rotary Club of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Saturday, June 19, 2021, demonstrated their humanitarian efforts by handing over 40 wheelchairs to members of the community from a donation of 200 plus wheelchairs, courtesy District 6960, Florida, and the Wheelchair Foundation. President of Rotary Club St. Vincent, Annette Mark, made a few remarks about the donations. The wheelchair project has been in the woods since last year and um, past President Ruben has spearheaded this project for the last year and a half, I would say. However, we did have some setbacks because of COVID and because of the volcano in getting the wheelchairs here. And we are happy that at this point, we are able to actually launch a project. We do have 270 wheelchairs to distribute. And today we have distributed 47 wheelchairs. The Rotary Club's mission include providing service to others and promoting integrity. This is where we end News Watch for this evening. I am Nelly Skippid. The Iron Government program continues. Have a good evening. As we battle the unseen enemy, COVID-19, remember to be kind to each other, be a good neighbor, help someone less fortunate than yourself, be your brother's keeper. Together, we can overcome COVID-19. A message by the National Reconciliation Advisory Committee. On this week's Inside Story, Building a strong foundation for our children. SVG CC agriculture students are ready to till. Dealing with the new norms in the public service. Alpheus Nanton is dusting off the ashes. These and other exciting stories await you on Inside Story. Saturday, 26 June 2021 on SVG TV at 5 p.m. Save the date. Welcome back. We are watching the APIs are in government. The international acclaimed Sandals Resort gets ready to launch its latest in a chain of five-star resorts here in SVG. The resort is expected to be completed in February of 2023 and over 1,000 Vincentians will gain employment in this area. The API Chevrolet McMillan captured the Sandals team on their recent visit to this country. finished product of what we're going to create here will put St. Vincent on the world stage as one of the absolute top tourism destinations anywhere to go in the world.
We had a lovely visit today with, with the team from Sandals, led by Adam Stewart, the chairman of the Sandals Corporation. I just wanted to welcome each and every one of you. You guys, you guys ready to join the world's best hospitality company? Yes. I am Kim Halvish, president of the Cement and Grenadine Hotel and Tourism Association. Just happy to welcome the Sandals group to Cement again today. We just are so excited uh, about being in your beautiful country. Your Minister of Finance, my good buddy now invited me and my family down here some years ago. That's right. And it was like love at first sight. The natural beauty of the place, the vibe of the people, and people keep asking me, why St. Vincent? And it's kind of one of these things when you know, you know. It just feels right. And we're going to do something here for tourism that is going to be truly, truly incredible. And each and every one of you are going to be a part of writing that history and that story. Beaches St. Vincent is going to be the first beaches facility um, um, built out in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, we're hoping that we can see a significant amount of incentives being hired. There are 500 persons who will leave St. Vincent and the Grenadines to go off to sites in, in, in Turks and Caicos, in Jamaica, in St. Barbados, St. Lucia. And when they're trained, they will be return in, returning to St. Vincent and the Grenadines where they will be hired at the Beaches St. Vincent facility. The training you'll get now is going to prepare you for either it'll be your choice whether you come home or whether you stay with us in other, other islands in the Caribbean or if you decide to come back home you'll be beyond prepared more so than anybody else in tourism for the roles and the positions here. So proud of all of you. I thank you for applying and I know that when you go out there you're going to keep the Vincent flag flying high. You're going to do St. Vincent and the yeah. Grenadines yeah. proud yeah. and when, when you're done at Sandals they're going to be saying they need more Vinci's. They need yeah. more Vinci's. Yeah. That's the plan. So, and the Caribbean is God's country. It's the most beautiful part of the world and I'm sure you believe as the why that this is at the top of the list of the most beautiful. So when you get that chance to interact with the customers and they say, where are you? They're going to hear your beautiful accent. And you tell them all about your country and what makes it special. Remember, you guys are ambassadors. You're not just employees. You're ambassadors of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And when you go out there, you have to do us proud and lift the country higher. I'm excited about what they're doing. I'm looking forward to them working with the association to build a better, safer, sweeter St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's really looking forward to an, an exciting um, opportunity for Vincentians and, and to boost the economy and to boost our tourism sector. It's going to add value to our tourism product. Potential for employment, potential for tourism, potential for linkages with our farmers and fisher folk. And this resort that you're looking at here has incredible bones. But the finished product of what we're going to create here will put St. Vincent on the world stage as one of the absolute top tourism destinations anywhere to go in the world. And visitors will come and see us from all four corners of the world and we'll exceed their expectations in all that we do. It's going to be a 350 room resort. They're looking at an opening day of February 1st, 2023. Construction begins August, September. Um, they're going to have over a thousand workers on the site and when completed, uh, they're going to have over a thousand employees yeah. working at the, the hotel. You know, it was Minister Gonzalez himself that showed us this property here and had the vision to see that it could be transformed and become the future beaches in St. Vin uh, Vincent. And I want to give you my assurance and my word that my team is going to do everything possible to make sure that you can achieve levels that you might not even know within yourself are capable and possible. And we're going to do something awesome for the country. So, Minister, thank you thank very you, much. You guys ready to go? Up next, we get some insight into the work being done to install monitoring equipment at La Soufrere. The hurricane season is upon us, and as we know, hurricanes can be dangerous. Listening to the hurricane warning messages and planning ahead can reduce the chances of injury or major property damage. Before a storm or hurricane hits, get to know your emergency shelters. Contact Nemo for the closest shelter to you. Have disaster supplies on hand flashlight and extra batteries, portable battery-operated radio and extra batteries, first aid kit, 
non-perishable canned food and water, non-electric can opener, essential medicines, cash and credit cards, and sturdy shoes and raincoats. Where possible, apply hurricane roof straps. Review your insurance policy and ensure you have adequate coverage. Do not take chances with your life and property. Be hurricane ready today. A message from the Agency for Public Information and this station. Welcome back. This week, a major exercise is being conducted by scientists on the ground to install volcano monitoring equipment at the summit of La Soufrere. We stopped by the Belmont Volcano Observatory and spoke with the team lead, Lloyd Lynch, and instrumentation engineer, Fico Williams, about the ongoing efforts. Mr. Lynch, we've seen you on a number of platforms discussing what's currently happening um, with the volcano. But this week in particular, the week of June 21st to 26th, important work is being carried out with, in conjunction with Calvin Air and assistance by helicopter. Um, catch us up to speed a little bit. Where are we at this point, midway through this process? Um, with regards to the installation of equipment on and around the immediate vicinity of the volcano. Right, so as you know, <coughs> during this crisis, we have been switching out people of different expertise. It turns out that Pico and I are engineers or technicians and our responsibility is to um, maintain the network of instruments that monitors the volcano. So we have been here um, going on a month. Uh, Pike has been here a month. I've been here roughly five weeks so far. Uh, I came in on the 17th. Good. And our role is to um, bolster or rebuild the monitoring network. We lost some capacity during the explosive phase of the eruption, but even before the explosive phase of the eruption, the equipment that we had deployed was not optimum. For example, um, erupting volcanoes are often instrumented with tilt meters that records the well, angular changes in the ground, swelling typically. Um, at this volcano, we had two instruments that were deployed to monitor deformation, GPSs. But GPSs sort of do coarse measurements. They, they, they're not as sensitive as, say, tilt meters. Um, unfortunately, we had no working tilt meter on Sofria and we, we got some donated um, just before the eruption by a company called Halliburton. It took about a month for us to get them, so they arrived just after the explosive phase of the eruption. And um, we are here to deploy those two tilt meters. One is already, um, well, almost ready to go at Richmond, and the second one will be going at um, Bamboo Range, near the area where they were doing geothermal exploration. Apart from that, as I mentioned, we lost capacity. We lost everything we had at the summit. So a very important part of the mission is to um, replace those instruments that we lost, a uh, seismometer, uh, um, cameras and um, a GPS plus uh, if weather permits and um, the helicopter sticks around long enough we could put a tilt meter there also Good. so um, in addition to that we will all um, try to densify the, 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 the the network by putting instruments in other places such as Fitzhughes. We didn't have a station at Fitzhughes before. We plan to put one at Greg's 
and um, there is another one planned for um, the Roma. Well, the Waterloo region, right, in, that, in, right, that, in right. that sort of region, okay. yes. Good. So, uh, before the eruption, we had eight stations. And as I said, we lost the summit. We also lost Fancy and Oia. Uh, not that the volcano destroyed them, but it severed the communication and power to those sites. So, we have been trying earnestly to restore at least the Owea site, um, so far to no avail, uh, but we think we can get some installation in the east that could, um, could get around the, 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 the communication that has been severed. We plan to put in a radio link to get some of the data out of there. Okay, so you're saying you're going to bolster the monitoring um, around the volcano. And there were previously eight um, stations. Um, is that likely to increase with the addition of new or different um, areas? There will be an increase in, in the number of stations, and we'll also put additional equipment. Okay, let me just take you back to the tilt um, uh, equipment. Uh, you say that being more sensitive. Um, I think it was probably a bit of providence that it arrived after the fact because, mm -hmm. or, or, or something to that effect because we're now using them. They might have been destroyed. Yeah. Um, just speak to the sensitivity and what information would have been gathered from the previous system and what specific information or more sensitive um, data is going to be collected through those, um, um, that equipment, sorry. Good. So I mentioned we had a, a, a number of GPS um, sensors. One was at the summit, um, which we actually lost before the explosive phase. And um, we had GPSs here at Belmont, um, Fancy, Montrose at Nemo in Kingston, and um, one was at Richmond. Good. But GPS measures um, displacement. That is if the ground moves um, laterally or vertically. But it, sorry, could I just interject? You say move. Mm -hmm. Now, we've heard in the past that ground deformation happens when there's pressure buildup. Uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, there's Material a kind of expanding the... in a kind right. of balloon fashion. Right. Um, so you're measuring just the distance moved. Yeah. Um, is it relative to a particular spot or is just, um, is it satellite or you, how, what is the baseline or what is the point at which you measure from? Good. So each of these um, GPS sensors, um, they can do very precise measurement. So if you have a long-term baseline, for example at Belmont, we have been doing GPS at Belmont since nine, um, 2004. Okay. So we have a fairly good idea of exactly where Belmont is. Right. Good. Um, the other GPSs that have been deployed, good, you can take the difference, the distance between Belmont and these others and triangulate. Oh. So you can get a, an idea based on how the sides of these triangles are Right. expanding or contracting. So it's a network, a network. of connected um, monitors that you measure the distance and That's movements correct. from each other. I understand that. That's correct. Okay. Whereas, um, well, the, the, the precision of the GPS is of the order of um, millimeters. Um, That's sensitive. Yeah. Wow. Mi millimeters in the lateral um, direction. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, it's not as precise when it comes to measuring vertical motions, good, but it's still um, very small, good. However, tilt meters can measure very, very small changes. Imagine you have a, a rod that's about half a mile long and you st stick a 10 cents piece underneath the rod it's sensitive enough to detect the 
slight tilt at wow. the other end. So it's very, very sensitive. Wow. Good. And 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 it has to be because the slightest movement in the earth will probably indicate something. Or or or, or are you going to factor in other um, um, yes. aspects with regard so to that? Yes. So these these tilt meters are what we call borehole tilt meters. Is so sensitive that it has to be placed in a borehole to um, make it a bit immune from the diurnal changes that are taking place. The daily heating up of the ground, and as you know, when things heat up, they expand a little. The daily swelling of the ground due to rainfall and moisture. So by going down about um, 14 to 20 feet, you insulate it from most of those changes. So it sees only what's taking place at the volcano. Okay. It will see also tide. That's one of the yeah the, 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 the tide from the yeah, ocean. Yeah, the, the swelling of the the, the, the the um you know the ocean. Sorry, uh, yeah. relative so to the tide. space, um, the, the 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 distance away from the the, the shoreline. Yes, yes. Wow. Good. So it's a very sensitive instrument. Okay. Okay. Good. So we hope that you know next time around, given that. Um, during the explosive phase, we, well, before the explosions, we didn't see much changes on the GPSs. But during the explosion, we saw a large deflation um, signal because we pushed out so much um, magmatic material. Good. So having reset the clock, so to speak, putting in those tilt meters, they'll be there to see if things start to grow from scratch again. And that is critical at this time. Yeah. So yeah. it's very important that they are maintained, which I think is something that we are going to talk about later. Okay. And I think Mr. Williams, Williams. will be assisting with, with, with some of that maintenance or just the installation. <coughs> um, both. Um, we, we work as part of a team regionally. Um, and of course, this is home, as you mentioned early on. I am from St. Vincent originally, and I've worked here in St. Vincent for almost 10 years prior to going to um, Montserrat, where I am currently based and been living for the last 20 years. And it's kind of funny because originally I went there with my experience from St. Vincent um, and working on a volcano that's active. And um, I went there in Montserrat to bolster the team. And then now I'm coming back to St. Vincent with the experience of Montserrat to work right. as, as part of the team. Um, and I always like to put a plug very early for the youngsters um, who, are, who have an interest, you know, to, um, in, in the electronics field, um, computer science field, just doing stuff with your hands. You know, um, it's an exciting field. It's not just about the um, geology and the volcanology. Um, the instrumentation is actually, for me, is where it's at. Um, so for the youngsters, we have a lot of youngsters in St. Vincent who um, tend to go to the technical college and after that they try to go off to do something different. But there's a lot and um, you're the ones that make it possible for all the other persons to do their job. So I kind of want to start low down there. Um, <clears throat> you know, but coming back to where Lloyd left off, um, and if I could pick up a bit. We, we will be maintaining the instruments, but at first, of course, now we're, we're busy trying to get them in. And um, we're working hard, you know, um, day and night. It's been a, a long four weeks and five weeks in some cases. Um, we've been working long days. Um, but of course, the experience that we have and the knowledge that we have, we know that we need to, to just persevere as much as we can. And a few persons have come by and, and give some support as well. So, you know, it's been, it's been great so far. So you've been in Montserrat now for 20-something odd years, as you've said. Um, I guess some of the inf instruments that you are going to install here are already um, actively deployed and being used to monitor that um, um, Sufri Hills volcano. Um, could you talk about the effectiveness and how it has helped Montserrat in terms of mitigating against some of the uh, risks that are currently occurring there and how that can translate to our St. Vincent experience. Okay. 
Um, yes, to answer your questions. Um, some of the instrumentation are there, but they're also um, very updated and advanced instrumentation that is part of this package that we're working on to some of what we have in Montreal. For example, we do not have borehole tilt meters. Um, <clears throat> we have, sorry, I, I guess I should correct that. We do not have the type of borehole tilt meters that you have here. We do have some very deep borehole instruments um, as part of a project that, that is used there and we use that data. But the ones that are being used here in Montreal, we don't have that in, in um, sorry, used here in St. Vincent, we don't have that in Montreal. Are they so. more up to date here? Uh, yes. And um, no, the instrumentation in itself on a whole, uh, Montserrat is a British overseas territory. Um, at the time when Montserrat volcano became um, active, um, there was a lot more push. There wasn't a lot of uh, the, the um, other things going on. So we had COVID plus we had dengue and all of that going on. Um, and the world was slightly different. So the support for Montserrat was different. It was a different time. And um, we were able to build up. It was the only active volcano on that level in the region. So we were able to build up quite a, a vast array of knowledge, skill set and instrumentation over the period of time. And of course, as I said, Montserrat is a British overseas territory and um, the United the Kingdom government would have had to invest a lot in um, getting Montserrat up. St. Vincent, on the other hand, has to start doing it for themselves and ask for help. And um, I'm sure that help will continue to Definitely. come as we ask. So we do have a vast array of instrumentation in Montserrat um, and that has helped. And having the skills and, and knowledge and experience of working with that, bringing that here to St. Vincent will help. Um, and what we're putting in now in, in St. Vincent, I have no doubt that for the next 30 years or so, you know, uh, well, beyond, really, um, you know, it will definitely speak to the science, not just for St. Vincent, but the, the data that will be collected um, could, you, could be used and would be used to help um, persons in uh, monitoring volcano around the world, you know. So um, the instrumentation is very important and it is very similar, but what we're putting in is very advanced and unique in its sense. So I don't think the network of instruments that we're putting in here now, that we're, what we're fabricating and what we're delivering and up updating, I don't think it exists exactly the same in any other um, location in the region. Okay. So, so that is kudos to our, our donors um, in, in that respect. Up next, we'll learn more about the importance of the Battle of Carabobo in helping Venezuela achieve independence. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. Early reading is the key, so help them read, learn, grow. Let's show them how much fun it is to read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. First and foremost, reading from so young is advantageous. Link with the teachers. Working hand in hand is a must. Just 10 minutes of your child reading to you is a plus. Get fun books, make reading priority. When children read, they are able to learn. And the more they learn, the more they grow. So parents help the kids read, learn, go. Reading is fun, kids have to know. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. This message is brought to you by the OECS USAID Early Learners Program, funded by United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to www.oecs.org ELP. Welcome back. The Battle of Carabobo was one of the main events during the Venezuela's War of Independence. The battle took place on June 24, 1821, when a Republican army commanded by Simon Bolivar defeated the Spanish Royal Army. Today marks the bicentennial anniversary of this battle. Assisia Sam speaks with head of the Venezuela diplomatic mission in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency Ambassador Francisco Perez. Thursday, June 24, 2021, will mark the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Carabobo, which sealed Venezuela's independence from the Spanish Empire. With me today is Ambassador of Venezuela to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency, Ambassador Francisco Perez. Hi. 
Good, good day. Ask. Hola, Polaris. Uh, ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. Good at Spanish for you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this very important aspect of Venezuela's history. Yes. I know there must have been some events leading up to this battle. Can we talk about the events first before we get into the battle? Yes, 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 of course. Um, we, are, we are preparing uh, this for this week and uh, finishing on uh, 5th of July because 5th of July was the day when the um, Venezuela signed the independence, definitely independence from the Spanish, uh, the Spaniard uh, Imperial. So we are preparing all this event uh, from now, from, from this week until 5th of July and, and so on. Maybe the entire month of July we will uh, do in some other activities. Starting uh, with the last uh, Friday, uh, we went, uh, we present some film uh, and we have a, a, a film forum uh, at the Venezuelan Institute for Culture and Cooperation and also uh, at the shelter, one of the shelters here in uh, Caliacua, the uh, Anglican shelter. Uh, why we are uh, doing this in, in shelter near this compound, uh, the, the headquarters of uh, the Venezuelan Embassy? Because uh, our commander Chavez told us that we have to uh, he called something like a uh, point and circle. Uh, that means that we have to, uh, as, a, as a people that have a, as a government, uh, we have to uh, take care of the, our neighborhood. We, uh, one month ago, more or less, we uh, give some donation, a, a humanitarian aid to that uh, uh, shelter and also in Bridgetown. Uh, Brighton, sorry, Brighton School. Uh, we 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 gave another donation and some other shelter near the the area, no. And by the way, uh, this week on Friday, also continuing with the film festival, we ha we will have uh, in uh, Brighton uh, a school. Uh, also, we are preparing a video with the, with the uh, artists, uh, Vincentian artists that are playing, playing music uh, dedicated to uh, the, the Battle of Carabobo. Uh, on, on Thursday 24, that is the day of the battle, we will have uh, uh, here in this uh, uh, embassy uh, uh, official activity. And uh, on 5th of July, uh, also another, another activity that we will have here uh, in, at the embassy. You know United States uh, in, the, in this moment in this moment is um, fighting or putting some sanction as uh, they, they call uh, against uh, Venezuela and is fighting uh, uh, with China and Russia for the influence that they have in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the history uh, repeat, no? Uh, it, it's cyclical. The 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 the, the history. Uh, we we have to 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 observe very well uh, and to study the history, to to learn about them. What happened in 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 our uh, territory in our region, no? Okay. Um, so I I I invite uh, uh, all the Vincentian to. Uh, uh, read more uh, about the history of Venezuela because we have very close uh, culture sim similarities uh, between the two culture and the two histories. Remember that the the in the indigenous from Venezuela came to San Vincent and and who the the British uh, tried to spell them. Uh, they mix with the with the African that were here and uh, that the, the British brought and well uh, the Garifuna is a product of, of that no uh, and it's our history. In fact, um, um, Simon Bolivar reminds me of our, our very own hero, uh, His Excellency Joseph Chatier. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the important is the action that they took, no? Uh, Chatier. 
uh, try to, to um, fight against the British, uh, the imperialist uh, uh, British, the, the British imperialists, and Bolivar tried to fight and fall against uh, the Spaniards. Yeah. And that battle too, the Battle of Carabobo, was a, a very strategic one mm -hmm. because Bolivar knew that area very well. In fact, for our audience who may not know, Carabobo is one of the 23 states mm -hmm. of Venezuela located in the north. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Bolivar knew that area very well, and that's when he instigated the battle. Yeah, and also um, uh, for those that know, doesn't know very well Carabobo, mm -hmm. as you see here, is in the coast. This is Caracas, but Carabobo is a, a little bit uh, in the in the in the west. So west west north, no. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you see the the Caribbean Sea and you see Venezuela there, the the chief, the navy came to Carabobo directly and he 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 knows very well uh, the area no mm -hmm. and he could do the strategy to to won that that battle uh, as, as you say clearly this is important that you uh, study history yes, of did. our country <laughs> and I appreciate that yes, so much yes. so June 24 would be a public holiday in Venezuela yes what are some of the activities that will be held in Venezuela to come right this day? right uh, actually, today started the Bicentennial Congress of the people of the people of the war in Venezuela. Okay. Uh, people of uh, all around the world uh, are meeting in Venezuela to discuss uh, not just the, the the situation of Venezuela, but also the situation of the of the war with the people, with the worker for 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 areas, worker, woman. Uh, uh, um, young people. We know that the Battle of Carabobo is not just important to Latin America but to the entire Caribbean. At that site, I consider it a spread site. What takes place there? Uh, in uh, the Caribbean? No, in Carabobo. Uh -huh. that, that area where the battle took place. What, what happens there? Yeah, we have today a monument there. Yes. Uh, uh, dedicated to Carabobo mm -hmm. uh, is the, the as I mentioned before the Ark of Triumph uh, mm -hmm. is there. Uh, it's a big monument uh, that we have in in, in Carabobo. Uh, every uh, year we have a, a, a how is called the uh, honor guard. Uh, the, the in Spanish is Guardia de Honor. The honor guard is there every day uh, to uh, guard the monument mm -hmm. the, uh, that uh, was built to honor the battle and Simon Bolivar. So every day you have a, a, a guard uh, 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 standing there in the, in the in the two guard. And one of the beautiful thing is when they change the 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 the, the guard uh, is uh, all uh, majestuous uh, activity. So. The monument uh, is there since many years ago, and uh, we are going to have there the, activity, the main activity in, in Carabobo. Ambassador Perez, thank you so much for talking to us about this imp very important part of Venezuela's yeah, history. Thank you. I'm really happy to talk to you about this. I'm really happy to talk to you also, and I invite, as I told you, uh, all the Vincentians to follow what happened in Venezuela on those days until uh, July 5th. And uh, continue our our brother brotherhood uh, and, and and friendship uh, with because the people of each country are uh, brother and sister and and we have we share so much the culture and we will keep uh, this this uh, this this friendship and I wish you all the very best in your activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Up next, we learn more on the importance of this country's consulates and overseas missions. This is CARICOM Secretary General Irwin LaRock. I took the jab, the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm encouraging you, my brothers and sisters, to join me. Take the jab and observe the protocols. We're saving lives and jobs. On this week's Inside Story, 
building a strong foundation for our children. SVG CC agriculture students are ready to till. Dealing with the new norms in the public service. Alfia Snanton is dusting off the ashes. These and other exciting stories await you on Inside Story. Saturday, 26 June 2021 on SVG TV at 5 p.m. Save the date. Welcome back. You're watching the APIs and Government. The role of the consulates and missions abroad are important for members of the diaspora. On this evening's program, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs discusses issues on migration and matters of deportation. Good evening, viewers, and welcome to another episode of Foreign Policy and Foreign Trade in Focus. This program is being brought to you by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade as we seek to share pertinent information on the roles and functions of the Ministry and relevant issues related to foreign affairs and foreign trade. I am Janelle Fedrick, Communications Officer within the Ministry, and with me is Ms. Shema Sears, Administrative Cadet in the Protocol and Consular Unit of the Ministry. I would like to say that this segment of the program is being actually brought to you by the Protocol and Consular Unit and today's topic will be Migration and Consular Diplomacy. Good evening Ms. Sears and welcome. Good evening Ms. Frederick. thank you for having me. Okay, I know that in the Protocol and Consular Unit um, you guys deal with so many issues relating to you know, diplomacy, passports and so forth, but today we just want to focus on consular diplomacy and migration. So what is cons consular diplomacy? Consular diplomacy relates to two groups or people. They are nationals and non-nationals. Now the first group, uh, which I refer to as nationals, those are persons who, let's say Vincent John Nationals, Nationals of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who may sometimes need assistance, whether it is through acquiring travel documents for the purposes of traveling. They may need documents to be authenticated, protection and help while they travel ab abroad. Whether it is through emergency assistance, repatriation, deportation, and so on. Uh, for example, our consulate in New York would from time to time facilitate the renewal of passports for Vincentians living in the diaspora. Now, the second group of persons, as I mentioned before, are foreign citizens and non-nationals. These persons are, are foreign nationals of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, so they are not Vincentian by birth, nor marriage, and so forth. Okay. Right? These persons may need assistance acquiring entry visas, mm -hmm. um, whether it's work permits, um, they may be here in St. Vincent, whether it's on vacation, and we know or some foreign nationals may live here, persons with dual citizenship. However, they may want to renew a passport. So let's just say we have American nationals living here and they want their passport renewed. However, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they may, be, they may have been unable to travel to the nearest U.S. embassy. Okay. So we would give them information as to embassy open dates, how they can reach out to their, their respective embassies, embassies okay. right, to facilitate that. Okay, one may ask, and I just want to put this question to you, how does consular diplomacy relate to topics like um, repatriation versus deportation and the impact of the refugee status application? I know that um, those are some of the issues that you're dealing with in the protocol and consular unit. Um, so let's just discuss that for a moment. How, how is that process being done? Well, the answer to your question is, is really simple, and that is through migration. Mm -hmm. Now, before I can really get into what is deportation and repatriation and so forth, mm -hmm. I would just touch on migration for a little bit. Now, migration is a term used to define the movement of people from a new era or country in order to find work or better living conditions. So I know in years gone by, a lot of persons would have moved to the UK, to the US, to Canada to find work uh, and so forth, right? And that is really what migration is about, the moving. Now, with this movement of Vincentian nationals, this of course creates diasporas, Vincentian yes, diasporas yes, in, yes. in different mm -hmm. countries. So if you notice, there's a huge population of Vincentian nationals in Toronto, in New York, and so forth, right? 
Now, the services that I mentioned before that the consular units or consular officers would provide to these nationals, this has sort of emerged as an evolutionary component of the work of diplomatic and consular missions. As more and more persons, as these diasporas grew, governments recognized the importance of providing these services to their nationals in receiving states. Making right? sure that they yes. have somebody there to represent exactly, them. Exactly, exactly. So it is therefore imperative for consular officers to be au fait with the immigration rules and regulations of these countries to better to be better equipped to assist nationals and persons okay. who need assistance. Thank you. You explained that quite quite um, clearly, and uh, I, I like your explanation for that. You know, having having persons there to represent our um, Vincentian diaspora. But I, I just want to touch briefly on uh, when we speak about the repatriation and the deportation part, because we have seen numerous Vincentians coming back to St. Vincent who have been deported, but and also the repatriation part. If you can just explain that. To, to us well you you are correct in mentioning that um, deportation repatriation uh, these are key migration mm -hmm. concepts mm -hmm. right what is repatriation repatriation is really the act or process mm -hmm. of restoring or returning someone or something mm -hmm. to their country of origin allegiance or citizenship as previously stated, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, in collaboration with our overseas missions and foreign embassies and high commissions accredited to St. Vincent, we would facilitate the repatriation of both Vincentian nationals and non-nationals. Oh, okay, I did not, I did not know that. Now, I would mm. just give an example mm. of, of repatriation, and, and this is speaking to our nationals. Mm -hmm. Now, the, we had the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. We had a lot of our sailors, you know, who were stuck in some countries yes, and couldn't, yes. right? So let's just use an example. Um, so a small craft, as recently, you know, fishermen mm. yes, would yes. go from time and encounter mm. difficulties. Now they end up in a foreign country. Mm. Now the relevant authorities in that country, they would communicate with our foreign ministry yes. and the relevant authorities here, and we would make the necessary arrangements to have them um, returned to St. Vincent. Okay. Okay? Okay. So for non-nationals now, uh, I know a number of foreign nationals would have been vacationing in different parts of the world when the COVID-19 pandemic started um, becoming, you know. Yeah. Now for non-nationals, because of the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. we have a number of foreign nationals who were visiting St. Vincent who were left stranded, you know, because of the fallout, they couldn't get flights right. and so mm -hmm. forth. So because of the precautionary me uh, measures being implemented by a number of countries, mm -hmm. um, this resulted in borders being closed and no flights being available. Uh, various foreign embassy officials and governments would have worked along with airlines mm -hmm. and our ministry in a collaborative effort to organize repatriation flights for their national. Just briefly mention to about the, you talk about the repatriation and deportation is something that is common that I know many Vincentians know about this term, <laughs> but just briefly explain and to us what is the deportation and how is it, um, how does it affect St. Vincent and the Grandians with our nationals? Okay, so deportation is defined as the formal forceful removal of a foreign national from a country for violating an immigration law. Mm -hmm. Now there are different forms of deportation. First, expedited removal. Now a foreign national who may travel to a, a country without the relevant travel documents or with forged documents upon their arrival, mm -hmm. that is when they, they meet with the immigration officer at the port of entry. They may be asked to be remove immediately. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you hear persons saying that they get to a place and they have to come back on the next flight. That is what you mean by expedited removal. So they're okay. removed without an actual court hearing. Mm -hmm. Now the second one is delayed removal. This is where a foreign national may be in a detention center prior to a trial for deportation. Mm -hmm. Right? If okay. the judge issues an order mm -hmm. 
for that individual to be deported. The receiving country of the person being deported, they have to agree to ac accept them mm -hmm. and they must issue the relevant tra travel documents to facilitate that deportation or removal order. And I just wanted to stick up in there for a minute. How does that play with the ministry? The ministry, uh, there is a communication through the ministry or through the national security, how that communication is being done? Okay, when we say the receiving country must accept. Mm -hmm. Now, that is in collaboration with the foreign ministry, mm -hmm. sometimes our consulates, depending on which country that person is being deported from. Okay. Now, the consulate or the consular officers in our consulate mm -hmm. must, in fact, verify that these persons are indeed Vincentian nationals okay. through our relevant authorities here, mm -hmm. and then we facilitate the issuance of emergency travel documents and so on. Okay, okay. They are not a form of dep deportation as well? Yes, that is voluntary departure. Now, mm -hmm. if a foreign national who may have overstayed mm -hmm. on a visa, mm -hmm. they may decide to just come back home and leave. They may decide to just leave the country willingly. Okay. However, mm -hmm. if this person decides to return to that country, never, despite the fact that they were not forcefully removed, mm -hmm. When they get to this country, the immigration officials there may deny them entry and issue an expedited removal order, resulting in their immediate removal from the country. Okay. And that's how we end the API's Iron Government. Thanks for viewing. If you've missed any of our past programs, you can catch these on our YouTube or Facebook pages at API, the Agency for Public Information, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, or on our website www.api.gov.vc Until next time, I am Bavin Oliver. Do have a good evening.